It was a normal morning in London and hundreds of people were on their way to work. How could two trains on a busy London railway end up on the same track, heading straight toward each other? On October 5th, 1999, tragedy struck at Ladbrook Grove when two trains crashed head-on, killing 31 people and injuring over 500. What caused this terrible accident? Was it human error, poor training, or a deeper issue within the railway system? Stay with us as we uncover the shocking events of that day in this Ladbrook Grove rail crash, which is also known as the Paddington rail crash. Before we dive into the background of this tragic train disaster, I invite you to subscribe this channel and hit the notification bell so you don't miss any of our train disaster documentaries. Ladbroke Grove is the name of a road and its surrounding area in the borough of Kensington and Chelsea in central London. This borough, established in 1965, is the smallest in London, covering just 4.7 square miles, and as of 2019, it had a population of 156,129 people. The Great Western Main Line runs through the borough and Ladbroke Grove. This 190-kilometer electrified rail line connects Bristol in southwest England to Paddington Station, near Ladbroke Grove. It fully opened in June 1841, and this line mostly used for passenger trains that can travel up to 201 kilometers per hour. Great Western Railway, which was called First Great Western at the time, operates both inner-city and regional services across more than 270 stations on this network. Westbound from Paddington Station was a British Rail Class 165, numbered 165115, operated by Thames Trains on a regional service to Great Bedouin in southwest England. Known as the Networker Turbo, or Thames Turbo, the Class 165 is a three-car diesel train built by BREL York between 1990 and 1992. It can carry 262 seated and 91 standing passengers, with a total length of 225 feet. Each car is powered by a turbocharged 14-liter six-cylinder diesel engine, producing 350 horsepower, allowing the 111-ton train to reach speeds of up to 145 kilometers per hour. Traveling in the opposite direction was an Intercity 125, running a high-speed service from Cheltenham to Paddington Station. Introduced in 1976, the Intercity 125 is a diesel-powered passenger train designed for speed. Each train has a British Rail Class 43 locomotive at both ends, with Mark III passenger cars in between. Each Class 43 locomotive weighs 70.25 metric tons, measures 58 feet in length, and has a top speed of 200 km per hour, though it reached 238 km per hour during testing. At the time, it was powered by a 79-liter VI-12 Paxman diesel engine, generating 2,280 horsepower at 1,500 RPM. On the day of the accident, the Intercity 125 had eight passenger cars, known as coaches in the UK, with a mix of first and second class. Each Mark III coach, introduced in 1975, is 75.6 feet long and can carry either 74 second class or 48 first class passengers. On the morning of October 5, 1999, at around 8.05 a.m., a Thames turbo train left Platform 9 at Paddington Station. It was a sunny day, with the rising sun shining behind the train as it departed. The train was operated by a 31-year-old driver, who had only been certified two weeks earlier. Since Paddington is a terminus station, trains must leave the same way they arrive. Just outside the station, the tracks are arranged in a six-track layout, with several switches allowing trains to move between tracks based on their routes. Almost all signals between Paddington Station and the Ladbrook Grove overpass are mounted on overhead gantries that span across all six tracks due to limited space. Shortly after leaving the station, the turbo train passed under gantry six, showing a single yellow signal. A yellow signal means proceed with caution, usually warning the driver that the next signal will likely be red. As the turbo approached gantry 8, it had to pass under a bridge that blocked the driver's view of the signals for much of the approach. The signal for the turbo was red, instructing the train to stop and allow an oncoming intercity train to pass before switching to the northern tracks. At 8.08 a.m., the turbo train failed to stop at the red signal, 
speeding under gantry 8 at 74 km per hour and accelerating. The points had already been set for the turbo to move after its scheduled stop, sending it onto the main line to the right. Meanwhile, the intercity train was approaching Paddington Station on the main line, traveling at around 129 km per hour under green signals. When the dispatcher saw the turbo run the red signal, he changed the next green signal for the intercity to red at 8.08.50 a.m., but it was too late. At 8.09.15 a.m., the turbo crossed onto the intercity's path at 82 km per hour. Both drivers hit the emergency brakes, but witnesses on the intercity only felt a brief attempt to slow down. Neither train could stop in time to avoid the disaster. At 8.09.24 a.m., the two trains collided head-on at a combined speed of 209 km per hour. The powerful intercity train smashed through the front car of the turbo, crushing it instantly and killing both drivers. The intercity's fiberglass nose broke apart on impact, scattering pieces all around. The force of the crash caused the inner city to push through the first two cars of the turbo, ripping them apart. During the collision, the wreckage punctured the fuel tanks of the leading Class 43 locomotive, causing a fire. Flames shot through the middle car of the turbo, creating a huge fireball. A survivor from further back on the intercity later said it looked like an airplane taking off in a burst of fire. As the Class 43 locomotive went off the tracks to the right, it dragged the first coach, Coach H, sideways. Moments later, the cars behind crashed into it, tearing Coach H away from the locomotive. At the same time, the remains of the turbo's middle car were pushed off the tracks, breaking its fuel tank and adding more fuel to the growing fire. The wrecked front car of the turbo acted like a ramp, throwing the intercity's cars G, F, and E into the air at odd angles. When the wreck finally stopped, a massive fireball ripped through Coach H, fueled by the broken fuel tanks from the Class 43 locomotive. One of the survivors, Miss Warren, later shared her terrifying experience. I turned my head to the right and saw a fireball. I was still bracing myself in my seat. I tried to curl up when I saw it coming. I twisted to my right and pulled my leg up, trying to get into a fetal position. But my left leg was trapped under the table that had fallen on it. I clamped my hands over my face and pressed the side of my head into the back of the seat. I don't remember screaming, but I must have, because I burned the inside of my mouth and throat. Then the fire hit me. It got incredibly hot and I could hear my hair crackling. There was a noise like gas igniting, and then suddenly, silence. When the heat subsided, I took my hands off my face. My right leg was still stuck on the armrest and it was on fire. I reached down and patted the flames out with my hand. Miss Warren was one of the survivors, even though she was in the worst hit car of the intercity train. Rescuers pulled her to safety, but she had severe burns. In total, 31 people lost their lives in the crash and fire, although only one death was officially attributed to the fire. Another 417 people were injured, with 227 suffering serious injuries. Some reports put the total number of injured at 523. Among the victims, 24 died on the turbo train, and seven passengers, including the burn victim, lost their lives on the intercity train. Local firefighters were the first to arrive at the scene at 8.13 a.m., facing a large fire spreading through the wreckage and sending a dark column of smoke 656 feet into the sky. Coach H was fully engulfed in flames, and it was clear that anyone still inside had not survived. Firefighters climbed over a nearby fence and entered the wreckage through a hole created by the crash, even before their tools arrived to cut the fence. Construction workers also helped by making more openings so survivors could be rescued. Despite the danger from damaged overhead electrical wires, which hadn't been secured until after 8.35 a.m., responders from the fire department, police, and London Underground acted quickly. They ignored the risk to access the turbo train, cutting open the roof and pulling survivors from the smoke-filled wreckage. Meanwhile, passengers in the rear car of the turbo managed to escape on their own, as their car stayed structurally intact and was away from most of the smoke and heat. At 8.28 a.m., the crash was officially declared a major disaster.
triggering emergency plans for handling mass casualties. This brought in more responders and equipment to help with the rescue. At the height of the operation, about 550 responders from different departments were working at the scene, not including medical teams at nearby hospitals. Unfortunately, the only local medical helicopter wasn't available, so ambulance crews had to drive even the most critically injured survivors to hospitals and burn clinics. By 1 p.m., the last survivors were rescued and taken to safety. After that, responders focused on recovering the bodies of those who didn't survive. Since both drivers died in the crash, investigators lost an important source of information. However, they were under heavy pressure to find out what caused this disaster, especially since it was the second major accident on the same rail line in just two years. It seemed unlikely that a newly certified driver would get distracted or run a red signal on purpose. At first, investigators looked into the possibility of a signal malfunction, wondering if the signal showed yellow or green instead of red. But they quickly ruled out this possibility. Investigators dug deeper and found that signal SN109, the red signal the turbo train missed, had been ignored without permission eight times in six years, which was unusually high. To understand what went wrong, they recreated the journey by running the same type of train from Paddington at a similar time. Their test revealed the main problem. SN109 was harder to see compared to other signals on nearby gantries, making it difficult for drivers to notice it in time. Since 1998, there had been plans to move signal SN109 to a better spot, but no changes were made. Now, investigators found that its poor placement was a major reason for the deaths of 31 people. They also discovered that at the time of the crash, the bright morning sun was directly behind the signal. The sunlight was so strong that it probably made the yellow part of the signal appear illuminated. Because the signal was already hard to see and the driver was inexperienced, investigators concluded that the driver likely thought he saw a yellow light and didn't realize the red signal was also on. This wasn't negligence. He likely believed the signal was showing yellow, not realizing that the yellow light was just sunlight reflecting off it. On top of that, the red light was blocked for most of the approach. This blockage happened because of electrification work done in 1994 for the Heathrow Express, which added support poles and overhead wires between the tracks. These changes made it even harder to see the red signal, which only became fully visible just before the train reached it too late for the driver to stop in time. The investigation found major problems with the turbo driver's training. New drivers didn't get enough preparation for handling confusing situations, and they weren't told about high-risk areas like signals with a history of being passed at danger, such as SN109. While the crash was mainly blamed on driver error, the investigation also revealed weaknesses in the railway's infrastructure and safety systems. One major problem was the lack of flank protection. On modern railways, track switches behind a red signal are set to prevent a train from accidentally moving into the path of another train. But in this case, the switches were set without flank protection, allowing the turbo to move directly in front of the intercity train. Authorities thought flank protection wasn't needed because they believed an automatic train control, ATP system, would be installed soon. ATP would have automatically stopped the turbo if the driver missed the red signal, preventing it from crossing the signal. However, the ATP system wasn't ready at the time of the crash, leaving the railway exposed to this kind of disaster. After a deadly crash in 1988 that killed 35 people, experts recommended adopting an automatic train protection ATP system nationwide, as it could have prevented that disaster. However, the plan was dropped after a cost-benefit analysis, CBA, concluded that the system's high cost outweighed its safety benefits. Thames trains ran another CBA after one of their trains previously passed SN109 at red, and they reached the same conclusion. Even after the Ladbroke Grove crash, a third CBA confirmed the same result. While ATP would significantly improve safety, the financial cost was considered too high to justify the upgrade. Since the driver responsible for the accident had died, no criminal investigation was conducted. However, in 2004, Thames Trains was fined £2 million for health and safety law violations linked to the crash. In 2007, 
Network Rail, which manages the UK's rail infrastructure, was fined £4 million for separate safety violations. After the accident, the signals in the area, including SN109, were upgraded. These changes in 2006 improved visibility and adjusted the layout to prevent sunlight from causing misleading signals. The Ladbroke Grove disaster left a lasting mark on the UK's railway system, sparking safety reforms, improved signal visibility, and the gradual rollout of new technologies. But for the survivors and families of the victims, the pain and memories never fully fade. Miss Warren's story is a powerful reminder of the strength it takes to heal after such tragedy. The question remains, could more have been done to prevent this disaster? We want to hear your thoughts. Do you believe safety systems like ATP should have been implemented sooner? What else could have been done to prevent this tragedy? Share your thoughts in the comments below.